hey, tonight I am not going to be preaching. Go ahead, applaud. Go ahead, please. Say, you, can pl- you can applaud. No, you don't mean that. But um, uh, you're going to be excited tonight. My, my very, very good friend, Al Pittman from Cal- uh, Calvary Worship Center in Colorado Springs is here. I got to be out there in March, and what a wonderful church. Norma, stand up. Everybody's got to meet Norma. This is Al's wife, Norma. We love these guys so much. We love them so much. One of the best things that happened to us in Albuquerque in those two and a half years is getting our hearts tied together with the Pittman family, and we just love you guys. And uh, Al has been out there as long as we've been here, and we're both in our 18th year now in the, in the congregations that God sent us out to pastor, and uh, I think they're as thrilled as we are at what God's doing in the places where he's called us to serve. Al has a couple of books. Don't look them up right now, but you can find them on Amazon, uh, Surviving the Storm, and it's just a, it's a really a biographical story about you know some of the, the challenges they walk through and in, in their life. And I'll tell you what, the principles that are in that book will help you get through your storms too. So look up Surviving the Storm. And then the second one from a couple of years ago is on spiritual warfare. So look those up on Amazon.com. But there's only two books there. Now there's a whole bunch of other books by some other Al Pittman who's not nearly as good as this Al Pittman. So look up those two and you'll be ready. But I'm not going to take any more of Al's time. I just want you to get ready to be blessed. Open up your Bible. You're going to need it. And welcome my good, good brother in ministry and and friend for life, Al Pittman. Come on, Al. Thank you, Bill. Amen. God bless you guys. How are you doing this evening? Amen. So good to be here with you uh, this evening and uh, to just... uh, uh, share the Word of God with you. Um, uh, Bill and I were talking, and he said, uh, yeah, we've, we've been uh, in those churches for, you know, came up at the same time, 18 years, and I, I thought it was 19 years. So I've had a harder time. To, no, I'm kidding. Anyway, just, uh, but I thought it was 19, but it was 18 years, and uh, serving in Albuquerque together is just such a delight. But I, we were here before. Uh, my wife and I were here before, so uh, it's good to be here with you guys uh, again. Um, if you have your Bibles, please open to the book of Habakkuk. Amen? In the Old Testament. Go to Matthew and turn left, and you'll get there eventually. Habakkuk. And uh, I wanted to share with you a message that's kind of just an observation, just looking at, at how God dealt with uh, the prophet uh, Habakkuk. Because Habakkuk is a different book from like Jeremiah and some of the other books whereby uh, the prophets were speaking to Judah, uh, or directly to Judah, and that type of thing, had a word for Judah about the sins of uh, Judah or Israel. And, uh, but Habakkuk is a dialogue between uh, God and the prophet. And so it's, it's different in that regard. And the dialogue is pretty interesting because of the fact that, you know, it's a dialogue con- similar to the dialogue we probably have with the Lord a lot ourselves. And that is that, you know, we're like, Lord, what is going on in my life? Anybody have a question like that for the Lord? Anybody ever wonder sometimes what is happening? See, nobody ever raises their hand when I ask that question. I think all of us Christians were liars. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> But, you know, we don't answer. It's like, how many of you had a uh, a discussion with God about, God, I don't understand what you're doing, what's going on, what's happening in my life? Anybody? Amen? All the time. And God knows that. He knows us. And so, you know, it's it's, it's a book that I found that was really intriguing in the sense that we get a sense of, uh, or or at the end of it, I should say, Habakkuk uh, is reminded of what really matters uh, when it's all said and done. And uh, the Bible tells us that we are, as Christians, we are kingdom people. And I think sometimes we get in trouble as Christians because we know that we're in the kingdom of God, but what we do sometimes is we try to live in God's kingdom according to the kingdom principles of the world. That's when we get into trouble. At least that's when I get in trouble. When I'm trying to live in God's kingdom according to the principles of the world. It doesn't work, does it? We're in the kingdom of heaven. And so Habakkuk is struggling here. Man, I like the fact that, and I love the, the, the scriptures because there are honest men and women there who are flawed just like us. And they have questions and issues with God. I mean, Job questioned God, uh, David questioned God and all. But I think in this dialogue, what we're going to do is just experience and, and, and uh, together uh, just God's faithfulness toward Habakkuk. And maybe you're here tonight and you're going through something in your life uh, where you're saying, I don't know what God is doing, you know. Uh, but, you know, uh, and Lord, I, this, this, none of this makes any sense. And yet at the same time, God is in the midst. 
He is working in your situation. He has not abandoned you. He will never leave you. Uh, you know, the, the, the gist of the story, if I could put it in one sentence, concerning Habakkuk. And uh, we'll, we'll look through the, the, all three chapters. We won't read every verse because, you know, I only have so much time. And, and uh, so, but uh, the, the gist of it is that God is always working out a far greater plan than we see, we can see, or even imagine. God is always working out a far greater plan than we can see or even imagine. The Bible says that he does above and beyond what we could ask or even think. Do you believe that tonight? Now, we may say amen now, but there are some days, amen? There are some days. And I think about, you know, what, how the Lord has worked in my own life and, 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 you know, some of the things that have happened in my life. But, you know, when I was a little kid, I was pretty honorary if you can believe that. And uh, my brother one time, uh, uh, I, I kind of talked him into eating some easy off oven cleaner. And uh, yeah, that's kind of brother I was. And uh, because it smelled, I don't, so this is going way back in the 60s now. So the easy off oven cleaner used to be a paste. You remember that? Anybody remember that? Uh, some of you in here, you baby boomers. And uh, it smelled really sweet. So I got a spoonful of it and told my brother you ought to eat some. I tasted a little bit. But I gave him a big old spoonful. Anyway, long and short of it, mom caught us. We were sick. We had to go to the uh, hospital and drink, uh, I think it was uh, uh, castor oil and milk. Mmm. And so that was the end of the oven cleaner because it all just came back. Anyway, but I thought about that in the sense of, the reason I'm telling you that gross story is because I thought about, you know, I can imagine the angel sitting in heaven and, and God saying, well, I'm calling that kid right there his, that's, you know, into the ministry. You mean the one that's being fed the easy off? No, the one who's feeding his brother the easy off. I've got a plan for his life. The angel's like, no way. No way. And there are some things that God has maybe spoken into your life that he's going to do in your life. And you're sitting there looking at your situation, your limitations, or you're, some of us as parents. And then some of us are grandparents. I'm a granddad too. But some of us, we've had children, man, raising our children. We looked at them, we thought, oh my, it's over. This kid is impossible. Or some of us were those kids, amen? When your parents looked at you, you're impossible. And yet God had a plan for your child's life, and you're sitting here now rejoicing in the Lord. But man, when you first, when you first look at that child, it seems hopeless. But God's able to see what you cannot see. God's able to speak into existence things that are not. God's able to do things in our lives that you can't even imagine. Don't judge your children or your circumstances by what you see today. Those things can change. They can change in your life because God is able to do the impossible. Amen? So we look at this book of Habakkuk, and, and this is, Habakkuk is going through a difficult time, and yet God is working in his life. God is working in the midst of of the situation that Habakkuk is facing. If you're going through something tonight, God's not finished with you yet. God is still working, even when it seems like he's totally silent, even when it looks like he's walked off the, the construction site. The Bible says that we are his workmanship. And I'm so glad God doesn't give on, give up on what he's working on. Amen? Amen? Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless this word. And let's see what the Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts tonight. Join me, please. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity. Lord, to look at your word and consider your truth. And we pray, Father, tonight that you would open our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, what the Spirit of God may be saying to us as individuals. Lord, I pray that the people gathered here tonight would not see me or so much as hear me, Lord, as they would hear you speaking clearly through your word to them. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to come and to minister to us even right now. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. We commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, 
Amen. Amen. Well, back up chapter one. Like I said, we won't go through every verse because for the sake of time, but just get the gist of it. Here in verse one of Habakkuk chapter one, it says, The burden which the, which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? The plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises and th therefore the law is powerless. The word is powerless. And justice never goes forth for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, uh, perverse judgment proceeds. Now, what's going on here? Here's the background. Habakkuk is looking at Judah. Now, some people believe that Habakkuk was written toward the end of King Josiah's reign. King Josiah reigned from 640 B.C. to 609 B.C. And probably toward the end of his reign, uh, or at, right after Josiah's reign, uh, Habakkuk is maybe writing this. They don't know exactly when it was written, but that, the estimate is probably around that time. Now, why is that significant? Because Josiah, there was a, a revival underneath the leadership of Josiah. But right after Josiah died, people went right back to wickedness. And so here he is, jo, uh, Habakkuk, looking at the wickedness of Judah, and he's perplexed. He's like, Lord, do something. We're falling back in moral and spiritual depravity. The nation is lost. God, why don't you rise up and do something? Have you ever felt that way when you watch the news? Amen. Now you're kind of getting a, a feeling of what Habakkuk was going through. Lord, do something. America needs your help, Lord. It seems like you're just sleeping. What is going on? Habakkuk wondered, like some of us have wondered, God, don't you even care? Don't you care, Lord? There are times we've wondered the same. But you know what? Here's the good news. The good news is that God, God's effectiveness, his ability to work in our lives is not hindered by our complaints. Nor is his affection toward us, his love toward us, diminished. That we can express our lack of understanding or even complain against God. And then God doesn't say, well, forget it. That's over. You know, it's over. I don't want anything to do with you. You complain, you know. But God understands this. Listen, God understands that you have a dust mentality and not a divine mentality. A dust mentality and not a divine mentality. The Bible tells us, in fact, in Psalm 103, verse 14, it says, For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. You know, we like to, to, people to see us as supermen and superwomen, spiritual, you know, sitting in church with my Bible open. I've got it all together. But God knows the truth. He knows we're dust. He knows the next trial that comes blowing along can just blow you right out. Amen? Because we're dust. And he understands that. I'm so glad God understands our weaknesses. And he's not discouraged. His love is not diminished toward us because there are times we are weak and we don't understand. And Habakkuk here is saying, what's going on? God, do something. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Who has ever prayed a prayer like that? Many times we have. Because we have a dust mentality, we can't see what God sees. God understood that Habakkuk could not see nor understand the whole picture, and neither can we. And so in verse 5, the Lord answers him. He says in verse 5, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. There are some people, you know, God is basically saying here to Habakkuk, I'm going to do something, Habakkuk, that's going to blow your mind. And some of us, some of us, God is speaking to you, maybe even tonight, God is saying, you're giving up, and I'm not even, I haven't even started yet. There's still a lot more I want to do in your life, and if I was to tell you what I'm going to do, it would blow your mind. And God is speaking maybe to some of you, maybe concerning your marriage or some addiction that you have in your life or your depression or whatever, and God is saying, I'm going to set you free. I'm going to do a work in your life. If people told you, you would sit there and go, oh, yeah, right. There's some people you know tonight that come up in your mind. If somebody came to you and said, that guy's going to be a pastor one day, you're like, right. I'm sure when people saw Bill years ago, and they thought, right, you know. Or me. 
A lot of us who are teaching the word today. It sure wasn't going by what they could see. But God is always focused on what we cannot see. And God sees so much more than we can ourselves. The little insight, what's funny here to me, is that the little insight that God gives to Habakkuk, you know, it, again, it blew his mind. He didn't really understand what was going on. The Lord said, I'm going to work a work in your life. If it were told you, you would not even believe it. And the little insight that he gives him here, it does blow his mind. Now, again, we don't have time to read all of it, but verses 6 to, uh, 6 to 11, he shares with Habakkuk what's going to happen. He talks to him about uh, an, uh, a group of people known as the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. You Bible students know who they are. They're the Babylonian Empire that was rising up at this time, and God was going to use them to discipline Judah and many nations at that time that were involved in idolatry and all manner of wickedness. And he talks to him in verses 6 to 11 about the, the, uh, the hatred or, or the violence, rather, of these uh, Babylonians by which they would come against even Judah. And then in verse 11, he talks about the fact that this Babylonian nation would all of a sudden rise up in, in pride and ascribe their power and their success to their own gods, and God will even judge the Babylonian nation. But the point that I want you to see here is that when, when Habakkuk hears who God is going to use to judge Judah, knowing Judah needed to be corrected. But when he heard the, what God, the people God was going to use to correct them, he was, it blew his mind. And so in verses 12 and following, he says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. In other words, Lord, you're going to be faithful to, to Abraham's descendants because you promised you would. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. Who is them? That is the wicked. And he says, O rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of pure eyes than to behold evil. You cannot look on wickedness. And why do you look on those who deal treacherously? In other words, what is he saying? He's saying, you know what, Lord, how can you use someone more wicked than Judah to judge Judah? How can you use someone more wicked to judge someone less wicked? You see what he's saying? It'd be like the Lord saying, I'm going to use Al-Qaeda to judge America. We would go, <laughs> we're bad, but we're not that bad. But God is not the, the, uh, the creator of, nor does wickedness originate from God. But many times God will use even the wicked, even though people are being wicked and they're rebelling against God, he will use even the wicked for his own divine purpose and his own divine glory. In fact, the Bible says that, that God has created even the wicked for the day of judgment. Sometimes he will even use the wicked for that purpose. But this blew uh, uh, Habakkuk's mind when he says, now how is God going to do this? He's, he's using somebody, this wicked nation of the Babylonians. These guys are idolaters, they're all these things. And, and in fact, here in verse 15 of Habakkuk uh, chapter 1, he, he talks about their wickedness when he says that, that they, have, uh, uh, they take up all of them with, with a hook. And they catch them in their net. And, and, gather, and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. He said the Babylonians are so wicked, when they would capture people, you know, a, or conquer a people, they would often take some of the people, put hooks in their noses, and lead them away. They were, they were a cruel people, a violent people, as the Bible says here in Habakkuk chapter 1. And yet God would use them to discipline Judah. This is blowing uh, Habakkuk's mind. And they were idolaters, as he says in verse 16. These people burned incense to their own dragnets. They don't give God glory. They, they're involved in idolatry. So this is an idolatrous and wicked person. And Habakkuk is saying, how are you going to use them to discipline people that are less wicked? And yet God would. He would indeed do it. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. We can't just look at a situation and go, oh, this is exactly what God is doing because we don't know. Seeing is not always believing. We can't look at a, a, a situation or a person and say, this is what God's going to do in this situation. We don't really know. We can't lean on our own understanding. I cannot look at a situation and say, this is exactly what God's doing, because I don't always know. 
Habakkuk was looking at only what he knew. He knew God and he knew the hearts of men. He knew the hearts of the Chaldeans, that they were wicked people. And he couldn't put the two together. How was God, who was holy, going to use these people to discipline Judah? So he's, he's perplexed. And then here in chapter 2, what does he do? What's his response? Hey, whenever God and life doesn't make sense, here's one of the best responses. Prayer. You ever been in a situation like that? I don't need a show of hands. I'm sure all we all have. You've been in a situation where, you know, God does not make sense. What do a lot of people do when God doesn't make sense? We rebel. We get mad. We go out and do something stupid like we're hurting God. And we're only poisoning ourselves. We're only poisoning ourselves. But the reality is that when we don't understand what God is doing and God doesn't make sense to us, that's a time to pray. And I love the Habakkuk's response here in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me that, and, that, and what, rather, I will answer when I am corrected. I'm going to answer the Lord when I am corrected. I love his response here because I don't know about you sometimes. Sometimes I, I do the spiritual pout thing. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to pray, you know. I start kind of pouting, you know, get mad with God, you know, and that kind of a thing. And, of course, you know, I can't say I don't go to church because I got to show up at church because I'm the pastor, you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, but some folks, maybe some for you, that maybe I'm not going to church this Sunday. We're pouting with God. We're mad with God. And you know what complaining gets you as it did the children of Israel in the wilderness? One more lap around Mount Sinai, amen? One more lap. Complaining and murmuring gets you nowhere. Habakkuk's response was not complaining and murmuring, but it was prayer. He says, I will stand my watch. I'll go up in my tower and I will answer when I am corrected. And I like that. I will answer when I'm corrected. In other words, I don't know it all, Lord. You show me. I don't know everything. God, you show me the truth. But that's, that's, a, that's a, the, the beginning of wisdom, you know, is, is the fear of the Lord. But it's also the humble yourself before the presence of the Lord. He says, until God shows me how to answer. Some of us, we, we already know how to answer. So we're going to just give people peace of our mind, amen? And we get ourselves in trouble trying to, you know, uh, uh, to give people our opinions. But here he is saying, I'm not going to open my mouth and say anything until God shows me how to answer. Boy, isn't that great wisdom? Wouldn't hus- it be great if husbands and wives would do that? Amen. It gets quiet on me. When I, when I bring that one out, everybody kind of, you know, gets quiet. But the reality is that if we will, humble, I'm going to wait on the Lord and I'm going to answer as, you know, as God corrects me because I don't know it all. And so we need God's correction, God's discipline in our lives. One thing I understand in Scripture is that if we're disciples, we're going to be disciplined. Every one of us is going to be taken to the woodshed every now and then. And God says, I do it because I love you. I know we all want to reach a place where we've arrived, and I have no need to go to the woodshed. I have arrived, Pastor. You know, God hasn't spanked me, and God doesn't need to correct me. I have it all together. No! We're, if we're disciples, he's going to spank you. Amen? I mean, he's going he's to deal with it. He's going to discipline us. Why? Because he loves us. He's a discipline those that I love. And so here Habakkuk is saying, discipline me. Show me how to answer, because, Lord God, I don't know what's going on here. I don't have it all together. And so he waits upon the Lord. You know, in prayer, in prayer. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And listen to this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Why? Because I pray rather than give myself over to complaining and murmuring and being anxious. And so Habakkuk does that. So response in those times when we don't understand what's going on is to pray. In verses 3 and 4, in verse 2 actually says, the Lord answers him. Then the Lord answered, answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because I will surely come, it will not tarry. 
Behold the proud. Who are the proud? The wicked, the Babylonians. He said, behold them. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. There it is. The just shall live by faith. We pray. We're to be people of prayer. We're to be people of faith. The just shall live by faith. That's not living by what you see. That's living by God's word and God's truth. The just shall live by faith. But he tells them, write the vision down, make it plain. Because it is for an appointed time. There are some things that the Lord may have spoken to you in your heart about something he wants to do in your life. I believe there are people here in this auditorium are people of vision. You, God is giving you a vision. God may be spoken to your heart about something. It hasn't come to fruition yet. But God is going to bring it to pass. If it's from the Lord, it's an, it has an appointed time. He makes everything beautiful in its time, the Bible says. It's in his time, not according to my time. You know, God was working on according to our time. You know, we, we want to be, you know, Lord, I'm supposed to be rich by now. You know, you're a little bit late, Lord. I, my schedule says I should be rich. But you know what? He's not, he's not looking at our clock. He's looking at his divine purpose. And sometimes we judge our situation based on what the clock says rather than based upon what God's word says. And we have to be careful of that. There are three things that I understand and I've come to understand about a vision. This may help someone tonight, but when you have a vision, some people have had a vision. Have anybody ever had a vision about something God was going to do in their life? Anybody? Anybody? Just me? Oh, yeah, right back here. Amen. A few of us. You have a vision. God is showing you, I'm going to do this. You know, one thing I've learned about a vision is this, and that is that first, it's, a vision is always based upon the Word of God. It's always based upon the Word of God. The second thing is that every vision has a shelf life. Every vision has a shelf life. What does that mean? He tells Habakkuk here, first he gives him the word based on the word of God. Then he tells him to tarry. Every vision has a shelf life or what I call a spiritual fermentation period where God has you wait and he has you wait until he sets things in order. He has you also wait until he refines his servant for that particular vision. The scripture tells us, in fact, that indeed God has, has us wait. James chapter 1 verse 4 talks about waiting. It says, but let patience have its perfect work, James says, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Lacking nothing. So the first thing about a vision, that it must be based on the word of God. The second thing about a vision is it has a shelf life, if you will. And then the third thing about a vision is that when God gives you a vision, give it back to him. So what do you mean by that? When God gives me a vision, it's not for me to fulfill it. It's for him to fulfill it, but in his time. This is for the Lord to do, not for me to fulfill. I don't have to be behind a vision trying to push the, you know, the vision up the hill like a huge rock and boulder trying to keep it going. No, Lord, you gave it to me. Now, Father, you fulfill it in your time and in your strength. The just, he says in verse 4, she lived by faith. God gave her back at the vision, but God would fulfill it because it was for an appointed time. We are to live by faith, not like the proud in verse 4, or the wicked, if you will, but the just are to live by faith, faith in God's word. Now, as we move forward, because God shares the vision with Habakkuk here in chapter 2, and the vision is really has to do with uh, God's judgment against the Chaldeans or against the Babylonians. And uh, again, for the sake of time, we'll move on to chapter 3 because we're going to get to the lesson here or the learned lesson that Habakkuk uh, receives from the Lord. And in chapter 3, uh, we get to the chapter 3 and Habakkuk now being awakened to the reality of God's sovereignty and God's sovereign power and God's judgment or his sovereign power and his judgment over the present as well as the future. Now he's awakened to this as God shares with him the vision concerning the Chaldeans. Now he's like, whoa, God, you are awesome. You are, man, you're in charge. You mean, Lord, you're in charge now? Yeah, I am. Regardless of what the Chaldeans are going to do, regardless of what the Babylonians are going to do, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of how you feel or what the clock on the wall says, I'm still large and in charge. And having that realization come upon him, he says in verse 2, he says in chapter 3, he says, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. What is happening here? It's a revelation. 
He's having, an, a, a, you know, a, a revelation from the Lord, an epiphany. You know, he's, he's like, Lord, thank you for showing me this. Now I understand that you are completely in charge. Therefore, Lord, regardless of what my mess is, you are able to revive your work in the midst of that mess. Regardless of what I'm going through, it's like God has to have a good day before he can do a good work. No, he doesn't. In the midst of your mess, God is working in your life. He's working in your situation. You know, I, I got to wait till I get this done and that done, and, and then God's going to work, or, or then I can volunteer at the church, then I can really serve the Lord. No, right in the midst of my years, Lord, in the midst of what I'm going to, revive your work, amen? Aren't you glad our God doesn't have to wait till the economy's right before he does a work? Aren't you glad he doesn't have to wait until everybody gets on your page for, you to, to actually, for him to actually work in your life? He works in the midst of my years. Lord, and I'll keep the context. He knows that these Babylonians are going to invade. He's aware, Habakkuk is, of the Babylonians. You know, he's fearful of them, but he comes to this realization that God is saying, I'm in charge. I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. It's going to blow your mind, and I'm in charge of all of this, that God's going to still preserve Judah through all of this. And he sits back on his heels. He goes, wow, Lord, then in the midst of whatever comes, revive your work. And that's exactly what the Lord will do. He will revive his work. In fact, the Bible says in Isaiah 43, verse 13, that indeed, before the day was, I am he, and there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work, I love this, and who will reverse it? I love that. You need to go tell somebody, nobody can stop me. Amen? Nobody can stop what God wants to do in your life. Oh, you can't do that, man, because the, 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 oh, I saw on the news last night. Well, forget what the news. I've got the good news, amen? I've got the word of God that says that no weapon formed against me shall prosper, and that when God does a work, nobody can reverse it. Am I getting too loud for you in here? I know you took the carpet off the, car, the floor, but I just, I'm sorry, amen? I mean, that's good news to me. Good news that I don't have to wait till the weather's right, that God is always working within our life, that you are his workmanship. And Habakkuk says, Lord, no matter how old I am, no matter if it looks like my best years are behind me or anything else, revive your work, the work you started in me years ago in the midst of my years. I hope you're listening to me because there's great apathy within the church today. But we don't believe God will do anything. We don't believe God will move, God will change anything. But God can't honor that kind of attitude. Without faith, we can't please him. Do you believe God's able to revive your marriage? Do you believe God's able to revive the work that he began in you years ago? You say, oh, it's past, Pastor. See, I was younger then. It doesn't matter, amen? God always reminds me, Moses got called to ministry at 80 years old. I'm just getting started. Amen. <laughs> It doesn't matter what our limitations are. It's how awesome our God is. And he's able to do all things. He's speaking to existence those things that are not, and to work, and nobody can reverse it. Let me move on. So in verses 3 to 11, you know what Habakkuk does? Once he realizes, Lord, revive your work. Revival, send me revival in the midst of the years, Lord. Yes, in the midst of the years that are coming upon this nation. And I think about America, Lord, in the midst of whatever may be coming upon this nation that we all love. We've just celebrated the 4th of July. We love this nation. But there are some things that are going to be happening in America. We don't know exactly what it is, but you know what? God is not sitting around waiting for America to get his act together. He has a purpose, and he's going to do his work regardless of what this nation might experience. When Habakkuk realizes this, he begins to go, yeah, let me, get my, let me get my attitude right here. And he starts to recall the greatness of God. And that's what verses 3 to 11 is all about. Uh, uh, 3 to 11, actually all the way to verse 
15, he is recalling the greatness of God. He starts recalling things uh, like the fact that in verse um, 4, he says, talks about the brightness of the Lord. His brightness was like the light, and he, and he, uh, he had rays flashing from his hand, and there his, uh, there his power was hidden, verse 4. And in verse 6, he stood and measured the earth, and he looked and startled the nations. And all. He keeps going on and on and on, talking about the greatness of God. What is he doing here? He's recalling God's faithfulness toward Israel, that God didn't bring us this far to leave them now. This is the God that we're serving. He recalls the faithfulness and the greatness of his God. He adjusts his own perspective. This is a great exercise. You know, we should pray and we should understand, as we've already seen, that the just shall live by faith. But we also should exercise recall in our lives. What do I mean by that? Just like Habakkuk's doing here. Recall God's faithfulness in your life. Remember what God has brought you through, how he's brought you this far. You didn't bring yourself this far. God brought you this far. Remember his faithfulness in your life. Because here's the deal. Recall makes us small and God great. When you reflect upon who God is, recall makes me small and God's great. When I realize what God has done in my life, how he's brought me this far. God, you are great. And I go, man, what, if, what do I have to fear? The Lord is awesome. Look, remember when we thought he couldn't pay the mortgage, honey? Yeah, yeah. Look what God did. Remember when we bought this church building or whatever, and we thought, oh, Lord, how are we going to do it? And God, we're still here. Look at the Lord. Look how great our God is. And that's exactly what he does. As he says in verse 12 of Habakkuk chapter 3, he says, Lord, you marched through the land. You gave us the land. How? Because you marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. And you went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your, uh, with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare their foundation to the neck. Lord, you beat them up from the feet up. Amen? From the feet to the neck, Lord, you destroyed our enemies before us. How great is our God. Think about the things God has done for you. The thing that you're going through right now may not make sense, but don't you let the devil lie to you. You just start to recall what God has done for you and say, based on his character, he's going to continue to be faithful to me. Therefore, I can rejoice even now because of who my God is. Amen? Based on who he is, not on my DNA, amen, but his DNA, <laughs> hallelujah. Not my DNA because you know what? Even when I'm faithless, he remains what? Faithful, for he cannot deny his DNA. He cannot deny himself, Paul tells us. So either he's awakened to this fact, he's rejoicing the Lord, he recalls the Lord's goodness, recalls the Lord's greatness, just like Jonah did when he finally came to his senses in the belly of the, the great fish and all. And Jonah said, in Jonah chapter 2, verse 7, he said, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to, to you and to your holy temple. If your soul's fainting within you, life doesn't make sense. God doesn't even make sense. Remember the Lord. Amen? Verse 16 tells us that when Habakkuk, after realizing this and under, and, and uh, uh, hearing the word of the Lord being spoken to him, he says in verse 16, when I trembled my body, when I heard rather my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of, of trouble. When he comes up to the people, that is he, who is he? That is the Babylonians. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. He's saying, you know what? I trembled, but I'm going to have rest. You notice that in verse 16? He says that I might rest in the day of trouble. The day of trouble is coming, but for the believer, we have rest even in the day of trouble. And in Habakkuk's case, even when the, uh, the Babylonians would rise up and come against Judah as a part of God's judgment against his people because of their wickedness and idolatry, Habakkuk says, I'm going to have rest even when trouble comes. Why? Because he trembled at the word of God. You know, tremble at the word of God today, you can have rest tomorrow. Some people are trying to tremble, you know, get a hold of God's word now, but it's, you know, when they're in the midst of the trouble, when they rejected him before, the reality is like trying to put on a parachute after you dropped out, jumped out of a plane. 
I mean, it's a little difficult then, aren't you? You know, you're falling, trying to put the parachute on. But, you know, if you would tremble at God's word today, that is, honor his word today in your life. And when the trouble comes tomorrow, despite what the trouble is, you will have rest. So Habakkuk embraces the word of God. He prays. He walks by faith. He recalls the word of the Lord, the works of the Lord, and he trembles at his word. And as a result, here's his conclusion. Verse 17, he says, I didn't understand at first. I was confused and I was wondering what is God doing and all of these different things, he said, but I've, I've got it now. I really understand it. And, and you know, the Lord has to take us through kind of that Habakkuk, you know, scenario to get us to this place where we begin to realize and come to this conclusion in verse 17. He says, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high hills. And he talks about he will make me have vitality of life. He will make me walk in a place of favor. This is what God will do for me. Because, why? Because God is my strength and God is my joy. He is my joy. And what does he realize here? He realizes that the produce of this world is not my source of strength and joy, but the presence of God. If God is with me, who can be against me? He looks to the presence of the Lord. He looks to obeying his word as his strength and his ability to get through those times when God doesn't make sense and life doesn't make sense. And he realizes that he comes to the end of himself like many of us have. And he says, you know what? Hey, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. I don't need the produce of the world to be satisfied. It is God who satisfies my soul. He is my strength. He is my joy. Therefore, I don't need everybody to applaud me or to, to appease man, mankind. My joy comes from the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And he says, I will rejoice in the Lord. The Bible says rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Here's the key. In the Lord. Not in myself. Not in my circumstances. Not in the economy. Not in Wall Street. Lord, I rejoice in you. And therefore, regardless of what I may be facing or what I don't understand, I, I can still be victorious. In other words, as a believer, those oppositions become opportunities for me. In those times of discouragement, it can be turned into deliverance for me. Why? Because of who my God is. Who God is, not who I am. I want to close with uh, just sharing a quick story here, if I could sneak this in. Um, because I just saw an example of this in our church uh, about a week ago. And um, a brother in our church, his name is Shannon Reese. Shannon, you know, was a guy that just trusted the Lord, lived for the Lord. His job was his ministry. And um, he just, he just, you know, he was just a, a, a guy. He was, a, he, was, he was an extreme guy. He did skydiving, biking, and climbing mountains, all this kind of stuff. He'd been in the mission field and all this. But he was a, a manager at a Walmart for 18 years there in Colorado Springs. He was killed on his ac uh, uh, in an accident while riding his motorcycle home about a block away from home. This guy, I mean, he lived for the Lord. And he lived for that which is unseen rather than that which is seen. And as a result of that, just to make a long story short, because he was an incredible brother in the Lord, I had the privilege of doing his funeral. And we had probably over 600 people at his funeral. Many of them were employees that worked with him. And 40 people in that funeral, uh, a ceremony, a memorial service, gave their life to the Lord. We did it, had an invitation to Christ, and 40 people, about 40 people raised their hands to receive Christ. And I thought, that's living for what is unseen. That's not just living for what's seen, but for what's unseen. He lived for that which is of true value, that which is eternal. And God is calling us again as his people, just as Habakkuk discovered, to not live for the stuff in the barns and in the stalls or what's on the vine, but to live in the strength 
of his presence to the glory of God. Father, we thank you so much for your word tonight. Thank you for this time, Father, to just be reminded that it is not by might or power, it is not by what we see, but it's what is unseen. That you are the God that is eternal. You are a God that is able, Lord, to, to do things that we can't even imagine. Lord, bless this congregation. Thank you for these precious sheep. May your word take hold of us and give us victory, Father, this week in our living. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, bro. <laughs> Oh, man. If I'm ever missing from here for a long time, look for me in Colorado Springs. I'll be sitting there listening to my brother preach the word. Uh, we're going to worship for a, a little bit as we close our service tonight. And I, I think there are some here tonight that just really obviously need to say, Jesus, revive your work in me. Maybe it's a start over. Maybe it's start for the first time tonight. But let's bring our hearts to God with that heart and that thought this evening as we close, okay? Let's worship together. That almost the last thing that was shared with us tonight was discovering that God is enough, that in Him you have everything you need. It's not the stuff that He gives. It's Him, amen? Amen. It's Him, and He's enough, and He's what you've been looking for. And so often it's the crisis of life. It's when the Chaldeans are coming and the Babylonians are coming. And then when you cry out and you say, God, I, I don't have it for this. I don't have, I love that statement that, uh, that Al made up, about in, inviting God into the mess. I, I, I wrote it down. God's working in the midst of my mess. Anybody got a mess you need Jesus to clean up and to, to walk you out of? It, it may be, that this may be the turning point of your life where really, really everything changes because you get the perspective right. It doesn't mean there won't be another mess you'll have your eyes on him in the midst of the mess and it's so important that you make that surrender to him um, how many of you heard some fireworks last night you know what fireworks mean now it's a party you, you know Francis Scott Key's song oh say can you see by the dawn's early light you know the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air were not fireworks they weren't party it was war last night in our neighborhood it sounded like war it went on until after midnight it sounded like war bombs going off sound like 38s being shot behind the house and maybe it was it might feel like that in your life tonight but that war that war can end tonight you can bring your heart to christ and say jesus takes what's left of the mess that i've made in my life put it together and i invite you as we close to come up and say to the prayer team i am ready to start running with jesus instead of away from him I'm ready to give him what's left. Communion is going to be served over there. If you'd stand with me, let's pray together and we'll dismiss and you can come forward for prayer. Encourage one another. Please pray for the Morse family, 11 o'clock on 7-11 here on Friday. We're going to be here for a memorial service and I can almost guarantee you, Al, there's going to be people coming to Jesus at this lady's memorial service because she planted the same kind of seed in people's lives. So uh, you don't need to pray for Pat. Everything's fine with Pat right now. Anybody know that? Everything's fine with Pat, but be praying for the family. And so, Father God, we just pray for your blessing upon your people, Lord. God, I pray for your grace, your peace, your power, Lord, the right perspective to look at you in the midst of our messes, Lord, to walk with you, Lord, when the enemy is coming against us, and to stand confidently in you, Lord, ignoring, looking past what we see and ignoring the lies of the enemy and trusting you wholeheartedly. And now, Father, I pray for those who would respond to you this evening to step out of the past and step into life in you. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. In the strong name of Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you and empower you and deploy you for his work this week. Go do some great things between the services. Amen. Amen. Al, thank you so much for tonight. Man, that was powerful to the heart, from the heart, and to the heart, from the heart of God. Now, tonight go home and look up Al Pittman on Amazon and, and look up Surviving Life Storms and look up Spiritual Warfare. Get those two books, download them onto your e-reader or order them, and they'll bless your heart. God bless you. Grace and peace. 
This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach with Pastor Bill Welsh. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.